Sure. Thank you. My name is Rita Loy Simmons, and I usually have a clear voice, but not today. I, I appreciate what these gentlemen have said. And two or three times I've heard the words public-private partnership. Okay, private would indicate that this is a profit-making <coughs> aspect. What you just described is those guys that are going to go make money out of forest thinning are going to spend one-third of their time and their energy making no money. So then you look at the words um, anti-donation clause. And that is a real struggle. How are you going to square public-private with anti-donation? There needs to be a major redefinition of anti-donation. I'm with the town of Edgewood. Um, I'm a town councilor. We've been farmers, ranchers, water company builders. We started something called the Intranosa Water System because my dad got very tired of having to carry for his bride the wood and the water. And he said, oh, wood and water, worst word in the language. But he was innovative. He brought us electricity first and then a water system. But if he had done it at any other time in history, he would not have been able to do it because of the rules and the regulations that would have strangled it. He came at the right time to accomplish something. As a, as a town official, I have found anti-donation stands in the way of many of our public-private enterprises. So please consider that word carefully. Thank you so much. I hope I'm Mike McNair from the New Mexico Black Chamber, but I've also formed a consortium of folks called the New Mexico Aquaponics Association. And I guess during all this innovation talk, one of the things I have not heard is how we're going to transform the agriculture community because agriculture, in fact, takes the lion's share of the water that we use in the state. And if we don't change the way that they use water, we are not going to be able to successfully do anything about it. And aquaponics is being used in Arizona, is being used in Colorado, is for at least five years, it's been used in Texas, and is working very successfully in those states. For some reason, here in the land of Manana, we not decided to implement it, but it has a great deal of use. A head of lettuce in aquaponics takes five gallons to grow, and traditional agriculture takes 300 gallons to grow. That's a significant savings. It's over 90%. We don't have to get everybody to do it. We just have to get enough people to do it to make a big difference. The other thing is, we talked about not having jobs. There are uh, there is a significant industry that we've completely ignored, and that is fish farming in this state. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity to get jobs from fish farming, and we just need to get it implemented and get a couple of rules changed to make it work. In other states, again, this is working, and we, we're not talking about just fish farming to sell it to the people in the state. We can sell it globally. China is making, making their living selling fish to us. Uh, we spend $4.5 billion on food and stuff that we don't grow in the state and we import in. If we took just 25% of that and moved it so that we're growing that food and that stuff in the state and spending that money locally, we've we got no funding problem. We can start funding some of the stuff that you guys are talking about. So I, I encourage you to, 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 to we, we need to take the water thing, just like some of you guys have said, and branch it out to the other industries, but really kind of think outside the box. And I think aquaponics is one of those things that that's time has come. We need to push it. I 
which wants to know if we want to take that. I, I guess that was a statement more than a question, but I don't know that I disagree with you. All, all these opportunities, and thinking innovatively, thinking adapting, as um, we've said, I think are, are things that are appropriate. Water is an economic driver, and why not use water in the best, most efficient way you can to get the most economic development buck. So I don't think any of us disagree with those comments. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think on the agriculture side. Anybody want some water? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so short of water. Really. Okay. I think on the agriculture side, um, we're going to see a big trend towards locally grown food and produce. And so to protect our water resources for food uh, production is going to be a major driver of a lot of land use planning decisions. And so in Israel, one of the factoids I didn't throw out there is that they grow 85% of their food. They support 8 million people. They have a gross domestic product that's four, five times uh, the same area that we have in our four county area and they have eight times the number of people. So, you know, you can uh, balance all this stuff, but it takes planning, it takes work, and it does change changing uh, policies uh, and looking at the laws that we have to be more reflective of the challenges ahead in the world we live in today. Dale, yeah, just two more factoids about Israel. They recycle 80% of their water. Most of their vegetation is recycled water. And they desalinate, of course, they have a, the Mediterranean Sea, 70% of their potable water. And they use 45 gallons a day per person to our applauded 150 gallons a day. So a third of what we use, and nobody smells it. It's more factories. Thank you. Uh, my name is again Leonard Martinez from the New Mexico Lake Grand Consejo. On the extraction of uh, uh, the thinning material out of the Forest Service, um, how would you address? I mean, it, it, the contractors are for profit. We all know that. That's what they're there for to just extract it and make a profit of it. Um, when the community has to buy the wood from them, they usually ask anything from $700 to $1,000 for a load of wood um, that's on the dam or on the What's on the truck. Uh, most communities up in northern Mexico can't afford, especially the ones that are fixed income, can't afford for the wood stoves seven to a thousand dollars per truckload for wood, and that's not even cut. Uh, so, I mean, there has to be some sort of when the extraction is done, is maybe for the for the people that live in the community, some sort of resources left behind that are not for profit, so they can uh, take home to use for personal use. It's not for it's not for how they say for a profit or anything, but what I'm saying is most people up in the just can't afford to buy the wood off the contractor. Um, what were the recommendations of this committee for something like that? Well, I'm not sure. I'm sure that uh, as the uh, as the contractors step up to bid for these stewardship contracts, we could pro we could try to make some sort of accommodation. Might it might strengthen the applications if there was a uh, uh, you know, discounted uh, uh, market created for uh, local residents who, who try to use it for keeping warm. The, the, what, what I was trying to point out was that about a third of the, of the, of the wood that, that's going to be taken out of or thinned is going to be dropped on the floor and not dealt with. They're going to be dropped on the deck and they're not going to haul it out or they're going to haul it out and have to dispose of it, which basically eats into the revenue that the contractor has to do the work. Forest Service is, is not paying them by the they're paying them by the acre, and they can do more acres if they can if they can find a market. There's just not enough population density around these communities to actually uh, demand enough uh, put put enough demand on the market to actually fulfill those contracts. So we're really talking about how to make, how, having to make an economic based market out of this. Find find you know if we if we if we figured out how to run a, uh, a, tur uh, a, a, a power, we could produce power by running a pyrolysis uh, uh, 
program and took the export the, the electricity to California, you'd have Californians buying uh, our power, the power plant buying the excess uh, cellulose, and you'd have uh, more people hired because the contractor could could take on more acres per month. So the economic development part of this thing really is, can we get jobs for the people in that market, not free fire up for them? No reason why we couldn't try to do it. That's something you wanted to do. The natural occurrence of things is that so much of that wood falls on the ground anyway, that he leaves the needles, they decompose. You've got to leave some of it there. If you want to put it through shredders, whatever. But you've got to leave some there to keep nature in balance. And then the word incentivize, I've heard that all through this. So we've got to apply the word incentives to your equation. Thank you. Before Elaine, Elaine jumps up there, you're your comment before was about uh, anti-donation. Anti -donation. There are a number of states that have addressed that. There's a number of uh, organizations that are doing public-private partnerships on water infrastructure today uh, around the country that have addressed the anti-donation issue. So I think we need to look at some of those states that have implemented that so that we can that here also. Thanks. So I, I don't think that it's insurmountable, if you will. One more, one more point. The, 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 the state does have a local economic development act that allows capital outlay from the state legislature to be appropriated to a city or a county and used for economic development purposes. So uh, after the meeting, uh, when the meeting reps have come up and I'll let's exchange cards and I'll put you in contact with the economic development department. But there's a there's a legal way under the Constitution to take money and put it put it to work uh, as long as it's creating jobs. Hi, my name is Elaine Hibbert. Um, the, the thought that occurs to me, sort of as we as I've heard these various presentations, is the law of unintended consequences. And we might be wanting, for example, the hydroponics. Might be a great idea. But the Bureau of Reclamation did a study in 1997 which talked about the benefit of the recharge from the ditches and drains and ag in the Middle Valley here. So if you take it all away, what's that going to do? Sandia National Labs with well, Howard, those guys. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> with Howard Purcell and Vince Tidwell and others years ago made a model um, using system dynamic um, power center to actually help us understand some of those unintended consequences. What happens when you flush a toilet taking water out of the ground and pouring it into the water, uh, into the river? And so I think that when we talk about all these things, densification depends on where you densify. Is it going to be on those um, great ag lands or is it going to be up in the heights? Transportation, we've got the 2040 plans coming out from the COG and I think you're going to see some very different trends. Should we be, so I guess my point would be Let's look at what some of these various ideas might play out together rather than taking them one at a time. And the last thing I want to say is that rather than focusing on how to break promises, which is what I think of adjudication is, let's think about things that we can do together. And one of the things that we might be able to do is, for example, put on a moratorium of transferring water rights from ag to urban and during that five-year period, look at how we can reuse our existing water, not buying new water to offset uh, increased pumping, but actually recycling it. That's going to take money. How can we afford it? Um, so thinking of reusing the money for the water now that we pump, rather than trying to buy more water rights and trying more on the ballot floor. We can also model that. Thank you. Okay, so Elaine, I'm just going to mention, I worked uh, with Vince and Howard on demonstrating that. And you're absolutely right, we took this water assembly and, and a couple of examples. Water assembly came up with 173 ideas. And with the... 43. The, what? 43. No, 
173 ideas and then they got it that down over the course of three or four months with the model to 13 or 14, which suggests that you're right, you take all these ideas and run them through and look at the unintended consequences and people will get together and say, yeah, these things look right, This or we can do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So I, I don't know that anybody here is saying they want to go only one way, but I think that we're looking at options and trying to be smart and how do you adapt and I think we do, as Howard mentioned this afternoon, the tools exist that didn't exist 30 years ago to, to do a better job of projecting what some of those issues and interdependencies are that we couldn't analyze before. We can do it now and maybe we ought to include that as part of our management schemes as we look at That's what forward. I okay. right. If I may have one point that don't spill my water, I won't. Uh, if I may add one more thing. I mean, think about how far we've come in the last 20 years in technology and everything else. All the processes that were there 100 years ago, okay, have evolved consistently. So you have to have the faith that in 100 years, we will have much, much better stuff than what we have today, okay? So we only have technology to develop based on what we know now. With the plan of making sure we don't really screw everything up for 100 years from now, that's all, okay? So 